verse 15. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. It is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. So Pharaoh told Joseph his dream. In my dream, he said, I was standing on the bank of the Nile River, and I saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and began grazing in the marsh grass. But then I saw seven sick-looking cows, scrawny and thin, come up after them. I've never seen such sorry-looking animals in all the land of Egypt. These thin, scrawny cows ate the seven fat cows. But afterward, you would have known it, for they were still as thin and scrawny as before. They were still as thin and scrawny as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I also saw seven heads of full grain and full and beautiful. In my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and beautiful, growing in a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were blighted, shriveled, and withered by the east wind. And the shriveled heads swallowed the seven healthy heads. I told these dreams to the magicians, but no one could tell me what they mean. Joseph responded, both Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin, scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years, seven years of famine. This will happen as I have described it, for God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity. <clears throat> but afterwards, there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. Mm. Pay attention to that part. Famine will destroy the land. This famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. Have you ever gone through something so bad that you forgot what it was like when it was good? Even the memory of the good years will be erased. As for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God and he will soon make them happen. Therefore, Pharaoh, watch this. Therefore, Pharaoh this is the part that we want to grab onto. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so there will be food in the cities. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Repeat after me. Store it away. Store it away. Otherwise, Otherwise this, famine this famine will destroy, will destroy the, land. the land. One more time. Store it away. Store it away. Otherwise, Otherwise this famine, this famine will, will destroy, destroy the land. Amen. If we have if you have if you're taking notes and you need to write down a subject matter for today's message. Simply write down, stock up. Stock it up. Stock up. Stock up.
stopped up. So at the opening and in our text, we see that Joseph has been summoned out of prison. Joseph was placed in prison due to some false charges, some trumped up charges that were not true, but nevertheless, at the time, they chose to believe the people of their culture and they did not believe um, Joseph's report of what had actually happened. And I'm just giving you some historical reference so you can understand how we got to the point where Joseph is telling the most powerful ruler in the world at the time to stock up or the famine will destroy you. But Joseph was in a bad place but he was right where he needed to be. Kind of like similar to Nehemiah, how he was born into slavery but he wound up having favor with the king. He was in the right place even though he didn't do what necessarily would have brought him there. Living his life according to God's will had him in the right place at the right time to be a blessing to God's people. So we see Joseph is here in, in prison and while he was in prison he had been interpreting dreams already. So much so that the butler who had now been reestablished and placed back in Pharaoh's court was able to give a report at the appropriate time that, that released Joseph from his incarcerated state. A um, little more history just so you know what we're talking about. Egypt. Egypt is in Africa. Praise the Lord. Egypt is in in Africa, in case you were misled or confused about where its location was, Egypt at that time was the one of the most um, the wealthiest nations in the world in Africa. Praise the Lord. Just letting you know a little bit of historical reference because I want you to understand this. Egypt was one of the earliest civilizations in the world. So the people of Egypt, the nation of Egypt, existed close, very close to the beginning of the time, before a lot of the other nations who now exist, existed. Um, Egypt's location afforded them a tremendous benefit due to where it was located because it was located in Africa. It was in close proximity to an area called the Fertile Crescent where rivers run through constantly. There were also, as you know, the story of Moses next to the Red Sea. What does this mean? Well, the rivers provided natural irrigation for the land, so they always had a surplus in their agricultural harvest. I want you to understand. They were all, and not only that, because the way these rivers converged, it brought natural silt or soil or minerals from the water that constantly nourished the dirt so not only was their crop um, um, consistent but it was better than better than because the soil was of a high quality, high quality. And then they were able to launch out from the Red Sea and take their goods wherever they needed to go. So that's all, this helped Egypt maintain it's wealthy status. Are y'all with me so far? They all they knew was wealth. Yeah. All they, oh, kingdom after kingdom after kingdom for a long period of time. They were they were wealthy because of where they were located and how they were planted and positioned in the world. So the Pharaoh has this dream. Pharaoh has this dream. And this dream is something he's never seen before. Even when he's sharing the dream with Joseph, he said, the cows were so scrawny, it's nothing i ever seen before. Well, it makes sense that it's nothing he's ever seen before with all of his life and all of his daddy's life and all of his daddy's daddy's life. All the cows were always fat. They were always abundant. Do you know any, everybody that seemed like they never had a bad day? Now, I'm going somewhere with this. That some, somebody that grew up in a society and they always had it good. I, I, I don't want to pick on nobody and start calling people out. But you have a whole generation right now, they just entitled. Yeah. And a lot of that is the parents' fault because we wanted them to have it better than we had it. So we place upon them this picture that it was never hard and it was always easy. But if you know the story of your parents, you know a lot of nights they didn't eat so that you could eat. Yeah. They lost weight so you could save the fat calf. Okay, I'm, I'm, I just want y'all to understand. I'm trying to give y'all a little bit of perspective so we can connect what's happening in the Bible with what's happening in our lives. Amen? Amen. Egypt never knew a bad day. Pharaoh never knew a bad day. So then when he saw um, sickly cattle and he saw a sickly harvest, it said it troubled him. Yeah. It said it troubled him so much he wouldn't grab his magicians because <laughs> they got no power. 
he went, he, 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 he went and, 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 he, and he, he sought out his, um, his marketing people and, and his financial advisors. He went and, and got with his counselors and said, hey, I, I had a dream, I got a bad feeling about something that's going on. And nobody could give him any type of, they couldn't read the trends in the stock market. They couldn't tell if they were on the rise or the fall. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? I'm, try, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to merge then with now because God is eternal, so it's all relevant. You understand? God isn't subject to time, but these situations are consistent. What the Word of God says, there's nothing new under the sun. And if you don't prepare for this famine now, if you don't stock up now, right. yeah. let me keep going. Let me keep going. That dream exposed Pharaoh to something different. Something that he hadn't been exposed to in his natural walk of life. Exposure creates expansion. Expo exposure creates expectations. When Pharaoh saw something that he wasn't exposed to prior to, his expectations changed. And he wanted to get wisdom about what he should do because he felt a shifting coming on. Yeah. So, the butler tells Pharaoh about a man who told him about a dream that he was now walking in. <laughs> the butler said, when, when the butler shared his dream with Joseph, Joseph said, you're about to be set free, and the, the baker, you're about to be put to death. Yeah. That's what he told him. And, and, and it's, it's something about a testimony, that when you're walking in it and people know your story because they were part of it. Yeah. It just adds such a level of credibility to it. I love yeah. I love Sister Mary Holmes because I'm a part of her testimony. Because yeah. I see her doing good. Yeah. But I remember when she wasn't doing good. So when she starts sharing her testimony, I ain't got to twist my face up like, all right, that don't, that don't sound right. I can say amen. Right. I can say I agree because I know her journey. I've seen her story. It's something about the butler's testimony that was compelling to Pharaoh because Pharaoh is the one who set him free. Yeah. So here comes Joseph. They let him out of prison. He gets all cleaned up. He shaves his head. They, 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 he looks real good. Then they bring him before Pharaoh. And he tells Pharaoh that there's a famine coming up. Long story short, there's a Pharaoh coming. And he gives Pharaoh the advice. Stock up. That's the principle I want you to understand. That we need to stock up. Pharaoh didn't have any precedent for stocking up prior to having this dream because they never were in a place of lack. Right. They were never in a place right. of need. Remember the story before this story, actually, the, the story of Noah? Yeah. No, and, and, and God said, Noah, go build an ark. It's going to Rain. It's going to rain. It had never rained before. There was no precedence for it. There was no premise for it. But God was sending a message to Noah because something was coming next that he had to prepare for. Remember when um, God spoke to Moses and the children of Israel and he said, I need you to slay a lamb and I need you to paint the doorpost with the blood? They never did that before. That's what this was the beginning of Passover. They never did that before. For, but he was preparing them for something new, something different that they had not experienced. They, 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 they mess up. They like, we never did this before. What are you talking about? Yeah. But they trusted the warning of God and they prepared. Likewise, Pharaoh was being instructed to stock up because something that he was unfamiliar with was getting ready to come. I'm not, I don't want to spook nobody or scare nobody or, or be the bearer of bad news, but it's important that when you have the opportunity to stock up, you stock up because there's something that is going to be coming that you are not prepared for, but that doesn't mean you don't have to be prepared for it. Yeah. Amen. The passage that we read is talking about a natural famine. A famine is an, ext an extreme scarcity of food, yeah. but it can also be a general scarcity of anything that results in a type of hunger or starvation due to the lack of that thing. 
So many times in our life, we experience famines and we don't even recognize it's a famine. We just know that there's something missing. That there's something absent. And we look around and we can't find it. And we search high and low and we can't discover it no matter where we go. Have you? There's a famine that a lot of us are in right now. There's a famine that some of us have found a resource to come out of. And there's a famine that is coming to your life. It may not necessarily be food. It may be finances. It may be relationships. It may be joy. It may be peace. Let me, let me talk to you for a second. Let me talk to you for a second. Have you ever found yourself in a dry and weary pain place? Yeah. Where you're just working, you're going to church, you're going, you're doing everything, but you feel no fulfillment. Mm -hmm. You feel empty. Yeah. You're just going through the same vicious cycle over yeah. and over again, yeah. and you don't feel like you're getting oh, anywhere. Yeah. You might be in the midst of a famine. Wow. You might be you you you, you turn on your you, you you turn on your your church music, but the worship ain't hit you like it used to. Your favorite song don't even move you no more. Wow. You may be in a famine. Wow. You go to this church service still hungry. Oh, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? You go you go to hear one. Of your, oh, so and so is preaching. Oh, I know they can bring a word. You go there and you sit there and you be like, I did a famine. Nothing. nothing. Try bones. Mm. Try bones. Mm. Damn, it's starving mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Have you ever found yourself there? Mm. <sighs> you ever try to find relief in that famine and don't know where to go? I like this story because the famine had it yet. But God uses Joseph and the people of Egypt to prepare for the famine, famine so that they will be able to endure the famine. So I want you all to understand that even though you may find yourself in a famine, God has prepared someone who has, always, who has already prepared and stocked up to be a resource for you to make it through. Amen this hard time. I'm a, I, I, I'll get to that a little bit later, but um, I, I, I want to um, get, I want to stay in here. If you just could to be so kind, just turn to your neighbor real quick and just say these two words to him. Say, neighbor, neighbor. stock up. Stock up. <laughs> That's right, neighbor, stock up. stock up. Joseph tells him, let's stock up. Let's stock up because once the, listen, you have to stock up when harvest is plentiful. It's, the Bible is, the Bible is an amazing book. It's full of instructions, and 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 and, it, and in itself, it, it then it gives you challenges along with those instructions. Because here Joseph says, "Stock up in the seven years of overflow, in the seven years of abundance." So tell, but then the Bible also tells us a lot of times that the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. So a lot of times there's a season when you're looking and there's so much opportunity and you can't even get it all because you don't have the, but, but, the, the, but you know, do you know what causes that? Do you know what causes the laborers to be few? What? It's, it's it, abundance. You ever notice how you got all the help in the world when the help needs your help? Yeah. <laughs> you ever notice you got all the help in the world when the help needs you? Oh, oh, I got some time to help you now. You got some time because you lost your job. Yeah. Oh, I can come through and be an assistant to you. You come through being an assistant to me because I'm paying you now. Yeah. But when and, and, and right now and, and right now times is tight for me too because it's not the time of plenty right now. It's a famine. So now you're coming to me because I was a little bit wise yeah. in the time of plenty, but now it's the time of famine, and you want to come to our store. See, that's that's that, that's the wisdom that Joseph gave Pharaoh, because, and that wasn't the plan. Watch this. That wasn't the plan. But because they were so prosperous that when other nations began to come to them because the famine was so bad, they were able to give them grain. Yes. They didn't really give it to them. They sold it to them. Yeah. And they were so prosperous because they heeded the, the warning to stock up that nations indentured themselves mm. to the 
Egyptians because once they ran out of money and once they ran out of linen and once they ran out of whatever commodities they used to exchange, the only thing they had to offer were themselves as servants. Yeah. This only happened because during the time of plenty, the people of Egypt stocked up. You have to do what is necessary in a time of plenty to stock up because if you don't, when the famine comes, you're not going to make it. The Bible uses things that are tangible that we can relate to to show us something greater. And the greater that we're seeing here is, yeah, we want to be good stewards with our money. I'm not going to overlook that or glaze over that. But we also have to be good stewards of our spiritual, mm. eternal mm. resources and commodities. Yeah, so when you're getting your promotion on your job, you cannot neglect to stock up spiritually. Right, right, right. This is, this is the word. When you get that relationship that you've been praying to God about, you cannot neglect to stock up spiritually. Yeah. When everything that you have been praying about begins to fall into place, that is the wrong time to forget the one you were praying to for those things to fall into place. Because a lot of times those things are falling to their, their place and it's absent of the influence of God. Yeah. It's absence of God moving on your behalf. A lot of times someone else hears your prayer and they know that that's all it takes to distract you right. from stocking up. Right. Mm. And then the famine comes and the flood comes and the sickness comes and you're overwhelmed because you have no anchor because you failed to maintain mm. that relationship with God. We have to stock up on the behaviors and the character of God so that we do not succumb to the natural inclinations of the world when we get these tangible things that we desire and are seeking after. Let me talk to y'all. Yeah, we all get busy from time to time. Yeah. Get real busy. Yeah. Going to work. Dealing with your family. Hobbies. Health relationships, friends, yeah. community. Mm -hmm. You ever get so busy and caught up with all those things and then you kind of neglect God? Be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I, got my whole, I hold my hand up. I hold, hold my Sometimes I, and like if, if I don't pray first thing in the morning, I question sometimes if I have any time of God time. Wow. If, if, if I'm not driving in my car and don't get quiet and I don't force myself to turn Pandora on, I wonder if I'll get any type of God time in. We're busy people. Yeah. We're very built, and and, and 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 it's the era that we live in, and we're all we're, we're, we're very, we, all of us have tenacious schedule. All of us have a lot of stuff that we're doing. The world and life requires more, so we yeah. just adjust it and changes and adapt so that we can maintain some level of some quality of life. Some a lot of it is just basic survival. Yeah. Doing what you gotta do to keep on lights and to keep a roof and keep a, a light. It requires a lot. Yeah, yeah. And in that process of surviving, sometimes God just takes a back seat. We don't do it on purpose. We love the Lord. Yeah. We understand Jesus is already. But sometimes we just get so caught up and by the end of the day, we're just exhausted. Yeah. And we wake up the next day and do the same thing. Oh, yeah. And we wake up the next day and do the same thing. Yeah. And we think that it's okay because nothing bad has happened. Mm -hmm. So that we think that we have enough God that once things settle down, mm -hmm. we'll be able to get back mm -hmm. to our study, mm -hmm. to our prayer, to our worship like we like to. We'll get back to spending that quality time. Has that time happened yet? Have things ever settled down? Do ever, did things ever get back to normal? Or do things keep compiling on top of each other? Do things keep to overtake you and overwhelm you like an avalanche? Yeah. I want you to understand that that's exactly how a spiritual famine starts. Mm. That's exactly how a spiritual famine starts. John 15, verse 4, and this is the New Living Translation. It's a familiar passage. It says, remain in me, 
and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. When you begin to become distant and disconnected from God, eventually the tie will be severed and you will no longer be able to produce fruit. And the things that what the things that become your wedge, the things that begin to separate you are your jobs, your relationships, your you're supposed to have all those things, but they should not take priority over God. Right. And a lot of times they do because we allow them to. And it's important that in all seasons of your life, you continue to stock up because when you get to that point when, this, when you're severing but nothing happens, you think that everything is okay? No, you're just working on residual fruit. You're working on the last time you went shopping. You're working on that last harvest that you had. And we get to thinking that it's okay, but eventually you will, will wear down from the rigors of life. You will wear down from the trials. You will, you will get discouraged if no one is speaking encouragement to you on a daily basis. You will have your faith shaken when no one is speaking life to your situations. You will lose track of the power and ability of God when all you see is the downfall that occurs with man and the way that they operate. Yeah. So staying connected is how you continue to produce fruit of joy, fruit of peace, fruit of hope, fruit of fulfillment and purpose. But when you don't stock up, when you stop, it's, it's, it's not that complicated really. If you don't go shopping consistently, what happens at your house? You gonna be it's it's, it's, it, it's it's not that complicated. But why would you think it would be any different spiritually? Yeah. Mm. You, you walk around the house. You walk around the house. You are the source of my strength. Mm. So when you stop going to the source, what do you think happens to your strength? Oh, this joy I have, mm. the world didn't give it to me. Oh, so when, so so when you keep going to the world looking for joy that they never gave you, what do you think you're going to get? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep, you gotta continue to stock up because if you're not careful, your well will run dry. Mm -hmm. And when your well runs dry. Wow. Have you ever run out of food yes. and did not have the ability yes. to get more food? Yes. What sets in then? Mm -hmm. Hunger. Hunger. Mm -hmm. And how do you respond to hunger when you can't respond the way you used to respond? Because now the supermarket closed. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have the finances and you don't have the resources. What do you do to appease that hunger? Mm -hmm. When famine sets in, Panic sets in. Yes. Desperation sets in. Yes. Desperation. You ever you ever been desperate? Yeah. Desperate is an adjective. And the word desperate means to be reckless mm. because of. I like that. You're reckless because of despair, hopelessness, or urgency. You're in a situation that seems hopeless, so you become desperate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're in a situation that there's a sense of urgency. They about to take my car. They about to repossess my car. What am I gonna do to save my car? Yeah. Desperate. Yeah. Don't always make the best choices in that situation. Hide my car in somebody else's house. <laughs> Park it where the repo man won't look for it. Desperate. Yeah. I'm two months behind in my mortgage. They about to evict me. How can I get X amount of dollars quickly to save my home? Mm -hmm. Questionable choices, desperate. Because right, right. you didn't stock up. Because mm. you didn't prepare mm. for something that you didn't know was coming down the lane. Who here knows that we don't always make the best choices when we're desperate? Yeah. <laughs> we don't always make the best Choices when we're desperate. Put your hands down. Put your hands down. Why is she with him? I ain't never been that desperate. 
Uh, uh. <laughs> Ooh, she must be desperate to be with somebody like that. He must be desperate. Right. Y'all ever heard somebody say that? Yes. Did you ever say that? <laughs> you said no and then yes, Mary. You funny. But anyway, I, I never I, I might have said it a couple of times, but 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 but, but y'all get the point. A lot of times you wonder how things come about and be like, he must have been he must say he must have money, she must have money. something must be going on there. Yeah. Right. People take the jobs that they're overqualified for. But the famine got so bad that they had to do what they had to do. Desperate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Desperate. Yeah. People out there on the street doing questionable things mm -hmm. because they don't have, they feel like they, it's the only option to make quick money or to survive because their situation has gotten so tragic because they can't get a regular job because of whatever reasons. They got a criminal record or somebody looking for them. Desperate. So now they're doing things that are desperate. Yeah. Mm. We don't want to get to the point that we have to, because we're so disconnected from God, that we make reckless choices. And if you have to make a reckless choice, let your recklessness reside on the side of the righteous. Be reckless in your following and adhering and being obedient to God. If you're going to throw caution to the wind, let it be the ruach. If, that's the, let that, let, if you're going to throw caution to the wind, throw it to the fresh wind that comes to the front. If you're going to take a risk, and if you're going to take a chance, then let that chance be in Christ. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. 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 Yeah. Every day, if we're going to be desperate, let us be desperate for God. Amen. And always stock up in Him. Why suffer and starve when we can stock when we can stock up and survive yes. the famines that we're going to face? Amen. We gotta stock up. So I'm almost done. I just want to give you guys a couple of places that we need to continue to stock up and then we'll be on our way. But the first place that you have to stock up is you have to stock up in the word. You have to stock up in the word. Psalms 119 verse 11 um, through 16. It says, um, thy word have I heed in my heart. Stock up. Hide the word in your heart that I might not sin against thee. That's how you stock up. Yo, don't just don't just say the word in church and then go home. Because there's going to come a time where you're going to need to draw from that storage place to keep. Because there's going to be a time. That this is this is this is this is this is the famine that you face. Sunday is the time of harvest when you're around your church family. Bible study is the time of harvest. It's the time of abundance. It's when you stock up. It's when you store up so that when you're out in a dry and weary place, when you're in the workplace and everybody's cussing and everybody's making their dirty jokes and everyone's just throwing all types of nonsense in the air, you have a word hidden in your heart that you can nourish yourself from and not be convoluted by the words of the world. Joshua word, Joshua 1 verse 8 says, study this book of instruction continually, meditating on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only, only, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. You got to stock up on the word. Amen. Stock up on the word. We want to succeed, but we don't want to succeed the way that God tells us we'll succeed. You got to stock up on the word. Yeah. I, uh, I share this from time to time because it, 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 it's true, it's powerful. But I remember when we were in transition into the you know birthing house of triumph, and uh, my mother and I, we used to do a radio show over in Jersey every Sunday morning, and a couple of times I missed church. I was with her, and things would happen that caused me not to be able to um, make it back to um, worship service on time. And um, the one time we had to help a friend get into their car, they locked the keys in the car. Another time, I believe she had a medical emergency we had to tend to. But there were things that, you know, make, caused me to not be at the place where the word was falling. 
But I was okay because prior to that, I had I was stocked up. I was stopped. there will be times where you will not be able to make it to the supermarket. But I'm glad I didn't wait till I had no bread. I'm glad I didn't wait till I had no milk. I'm glad that I, it was my routine and it was my custom and my practice to stay on the better side of overflow. So if I get to a point where I can't make it to my refilling station, I still got some word to work with. Stop up. You got to stock up on your praise. Yes. Psalm 34, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will continually speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. You got to stock up on your praise. Yeah, I encourage and inspire everyone when they come at you. It was, it was, it was good when we praised and we were worshiping God this morning. The young people were dancing. I don't know if they were singing or if they were just, just letting themselves be free. But we have to stock up on our praise because there's going to be times where you just don't feel like singing. Yeah. Oh, uh, y'all, that guy, y'all. And listen, I love to sing. Yeah. I love to, I'll bust into a soul in a second. <laughs> but there's going to be times where you just don't but, but, and, and, and check this out, check this out. And then there's going to be times where you can't sing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about anybody else, any vocalists, but man, allergy seems to be getting the best of me sometimes. I'll be like, and then you know, you got the flu, cold, and flu. Season. Ain't nothing worse than when you want to sing and you physically cannot do it. You be like, everything flat, everything sharp, everything yucky. Yes. That usually happens to me right around Holy Convocation. They're like, we got to sing 10 songs. And I'm like, I ain't got no voice for this. But if you stock up on your praise, yes. if you sing every chance you get, yes. don't, be, don't, don't be sitting in church and everybody else worshiping, singing, and singing praises, and you just there like they got it. Now, you better praise them now. Right, stock right. up. Because there's going to be a time. That, I mean, do I have anybody people that really love to praise God? You ever be sitting there like, I want to sing something that don't even know which song you want to sing? Yeah. Like, that, 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 that's what I, that, I I need to hear something. That, like, I'm down in my so you, Do you know what, like, the, the thing that really brought David to, into to be affluent in the, in, in, in the kingdom of Saul was his ability to praise. Yeah. That's why they brought him in. Think about that. They brought him in to praise God and soothe the evil spirits that were over Saul. Yeah. Him being a warrior and eventually the anointed king. That's a, they really didn't bring him in. That, that's what caused the that's what caused the divide. The fact that he was a warrior like he was, and the fact that they knew eventually he was going to succeed Saul just yeah. because of the caliber of person he was. Yeah. But they brought him in because of his praise. Amen. And he needed that when he was being persecuted. He had stocked up. Stock up on your praise. Stock up on the word. Stock up on the praise. Stock up on your prayer. Yeah. You got to stock up on your prayer. Never stop praying. That's what 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 17 says. It says. Pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. James 5 and 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results or as Mary was saying the fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. Amen? Amen. 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 You gotta stock up on your prayer. Yes. Stock up on it. And think about it. Be honest. Be honest. You ain't gotta say amen. You ain't gotta nod your hat. Remember, look up. Look the other way. But when you think about it in those times of life we're right before the famine strikes were you really stocking up on the word? Were you really stocking up on, on your prayer? Were you really stocking up on your praise? I like the story of the, uh, the little ants and the grasshopper. And how in the summertime, the grasshopper just hopped around and he was just frolicking along and he was just playing to have a good time. And the ants were working. The ants were working. They were stocking up because the ants knew winter would be there soon. And then there wouldn't be food lying on the ground from people picnicking or walking the streets, leaving stuff. And the grasshopper just living his best life, hoppity hop, hoppity hop. And then when winter came, he didn't have no food. And he went to the ants. He was like, hey, let's break bread. And it's like, nah. Because while you was playing, we was working. Right. And now right. we down here and we enjoying the late, the fruits of our labor. And yeah. you need to enjoy the fruits of your labor, too. Yeah. You played, yes. and now you have nothing. Mm -hmm. It's stocked up. Mm. It's stocked up. Mm. I like stocking up in prayer, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. I like, like, like and, and, and 
And let me just share, you got to pray. Like we were talking about prayer earlier, but you, you got to really, you got to pray. And you can't get upset when your prayer don't, the answer don't just magically fall out Amen. the sky instantaneously. You got to pray. And you got to believe in what you're praying for. You got to believe in who you're praying to. We teach this all the time when we talk about God because God is eternal. Yes. God isn't subject to our time. God can care less about an hour, minute, second. Yes. He, 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 like, like in the beginning, that's the first, like in the beginning in the Bible. In the beginning, that's what it says. In the beginning, at the start, at the Genesis, God already was. So if you have the beginning right here and time travels that way, the beginning right here, God was over here. Right, right. Like, like, so at, God, God doesn't care about time. So when you're praying in time, don't think God's not hearing you. He already heard you. Yeah. He heard your prayer before you were conceived in the womb. Yeah. Because he's eternal. So you have to you have to really understand God when you're praying. Mm -hmm. And stop limiting God to your expectations or your time. Because God got all the time in the world to answer your prayer. Amen. And he's going to answer your prayer at the appropriate time. Amen. And it's our job to stock up on prayer. Keep praying. Keep praying. I like that when people say you should keep praying for the same thing. Jesus prayed for the same thing three times in one night. That's <laughs> what is your precedence for saying that? Like, no, if, if, if you want to make sure, keep praying. Right. Pray without ceasing. You should stock up on the word, stock up on praise, stock up on prayer, and finally stock up on worship. I had to separate praise from worship because a lot of people don't understand that they're two separate things. Yeah. But you have to stock up on worship. Yes. I, I, I mean, I, I love, I like, I, 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 I try to simplify it and like, you know, we praise God for what he's done, but we worship God for who he is. Yes. Like we worship God for who he is. That's the simplest way I can define it so people can know the difference between the two. And when you worship God for who he is, that should never change. And you, so you should, you're always able to worship God. When it's raining, you can worship God. When it's snowing, you can worship God. When you feel great, you can worship God. When your back hurts, you can worship God. Because it ain't got nothing to do with you in this present God time. It has to do with the eternal God. He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And when you get to the point, like we were talking earlier, that you understand who God is, you can always worship him. You can always praise him. And you can always have an expectation of greatness for him, whether Bush is in office, Obama's in office, or Trump is in office. God is on the throne. He don't change. So it doesn't matter if the stock market is up or if the stock market is down. It doesn't matter if you're up for a promotion or if you're up for a demotion. It doesn't matter if you just got a raise or you just got your walking papers. God is still worthy of worship. Yeah. And you got to stock up on that worship. Because the moment the famine comes, you're going to need to be able to draw from that place. Yeah. Yeah. The moment when that depression tries to hit you, you're going to need to be able to draw from that place of worship. Yeah. But if you haven't stocked up, then from where will you draw from? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. From where will you draw from? You have to stock up on your prayer. You have to stock up on your words. Stock up on your worship. Stock up on your praise. And you have to understand that it's never too late to stock up. See, in the scripture that we looked at, if they would have waited till the famine came to start stocking up, it would have been too late. Yeah, amen. When the rain started falling and the ark was built and then God told Noah to close the door, it was too late to try to get in. It was too late. When, 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 when the bridegroom came and, and the five foolish maids did that, it was too late to get into the set. It was too late. But the wise ones had taken preparation and had enough oil so that they were ready for when the bridegroom came. But I want you to understand in this situation, it's not too late to start stocking up on kingdom currency. Amen. Because not what's stopping you from praying right now? Yeah. What's hindering you from worshiping right now? Yeah. What's holding you back from getting a better revelation of God by studying his word right now? Can you be in the hospital and have a Bible open? Yeah. So you don't need to be in a study to study the word? Yeah. Amen. Nothing is stopping you from stocking up right now. Amen. There's no reason for you to not start building your kingdom cachet right now. Mm. Nothing can stop you from feeding and filling your spirit, man. 
so that you have a surplus when the famine arrives. Stock up, saints. Stock up. Stock up. Because you need more than 90 minutes on Sunday morning. That's right. Stock up. Stock up. You wouldn't try to live off of one. And, and, I, and I'm done. Um, it's always, every Tuesday, when we're here and we're feeding the people, they come in by the droves now. And a lot of them say, this is the only good meal I get all week long. So I don't miss it. And when you see, listen, when you see their physical condition, yeah. you know you're like, make sure you get enough. Right. You know, at 7 o'clock, we have seconds. If you need, come back. A lot of them come back. A lot of them stay and wait. It's the only good. Think about what your spiritual man looks like. See, we get to see them in the natural and be like, oh, yeah. thank you, Jesus, yeah. for, for food, shelter, and clothes. Hallelujah. Thank you. For physical. But imagine, imagine what that thing inside of you that is going to remain and exist for eternity looks like off of one small meal. You're supposed to have three balanced meals a day. Yeah. You get one meal a week. Suck up. Don't take your spiritual nourishment for granted. Yeah. Because you're going to need it. You're going to need it. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word, Father God. We thank you for just taking the time, hallelujah, to, to, to remind us of the necessity to not take the opportunity to glean in your spiritual vineyards for granted, God, but just to allow us to understand that it is important that we continue to harvest your word and harvest your character and harvest your principles and, and harvest your techniques, Lord Jesus, so that we can apply them to our lives and survive the famine that we are presently experiencing and the one that is going to come soon, Father God, because there is going to come a time, hallelujah, where, where sound doctrine will, will, will be rare and where people will listen to anything that sounds good, that they will have itchy ears and they will fail, hallelujah, to be drawn to the unadulterated word of God because it will be something that is far from them, God. Oh, let us, God, in the name of Jesus, store up, hallelujah, and stock up on your word and your wisdom and so that we can regurgitate it to the people who are suffering from a lack of knowledge. Hallelujah. You said your people perish because of a lack of knowledge. And there is a lack of knowledge because we're not stocking up in it. We're not stocking up on kingdom principles. We're stocking up on the foolishness that just tickles the ears. And it's a sounding of a brass cymbal in your ear, Father God. Let us stock up on the word that will give us strength. Let us stock up on words of correction. Let us stock up on words of empowerment. Let us stock up on words that give us good foundation, God. Let us not forget, hallelujah, that you chastise those that you love. Let us stock up on that. Let us stock up on the word that says that we should be holy for you are holy. Let us stock up on that. Let us stock up on the word that says it's none but the righteous shall see you and that we should sanctify ourselves. Yes. Yes. Hey, the messages that are far from the gospel pulpits in your kingdom, God. Let us stock up on those and not be afraid to share them with people when they're trying to determine why they don't feel close to you anymore. Yes, yes, amen. Why they don't feel like they can hear your voice. Why they question if you exist. Mm. Let us be able to boldly proclaim the truth because we have an abundance and an overflow of it stocked up for such a time as this where people are in a famine for your truth and your gospel. These things we pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen.